All right, everyone. Well, welcome to our new Artist Friday webinar. This session is all about helping you get up and running with Luminar AI and making sure you feel comfortable with the software so you can be successful. My name is Angela Andrew, and I'm a product evangelist for Skylum Software. I've been with the company since uh, late 2017. I'm also a fine art photographer and run my own business. So I love post-processing. Uh, it's, it's just a passion of mine. Is I like it as much as I love being behind the camera. So working with a photography software company is a ton of fun. Uh, some of the things we're going to cover today is the basics of installing and activating the software, uh, some quick editing tips, how to open your images, uh, batch processing, so how you can sync in, uh, edits across several images. Uh, we'll briefly touch on using Luminar AI as a plugin and how to get those images out of Luminar AI so you can actually use them on social media, get them printed, email them to your friends and family and whatnot. All right, we'll start with installing and activating Luminar AI. The biggest thing here is you need to create a, um, a Skylum account. So before you install the software, go to the Skylum.com website and create an account. Just because you made, an, made a purchase does not automatically create an account for you. Once that account is created, then you'll be able to activate your software. The one thing you wanna make sure is that you're using the same email address that you used for your purchase as you do with your Skylum account. After the fact, you can connect other email addresses to your account, not a problem. So if you have software that you've registered in the past with a different email address, you can link those up. But you want to make sure you use the same email address that you use for your purchase as you do for your Skylum account to activate Luminar AI. All right, from there, next thing is going to be to open up some images. So let me pop over here to Luminar AI, and I'll show you a couple of different ways that you can get your images into the software. My favorite way is to use this plus button here at the top. It's the quickest and easiest. This will allow you to browse your hard drive to add a folder. Or if you prefer to work on one image at a time, you can load up a single image. Once you add a folder, they're going to show up here under the folders panel. Anything you add with using add image, a single image, will be here under your single image edits. And give me a second. Let me turn on my cursor marker here so you guys can see a little bit better what I'm pointing at. Um, and then once you have your, your photos in here and your, um, all your folders, you can create albums for different topics if you like. It's just another way to help you organize your images. This doesn't actually move anything on your hard drive. It just points to it. Same with the folders. If you already have a hard drive or a portion of your hard drive set aside for your photos, Luminar does not move those. It merely points to them and you can use those folders with other applications as well. It doesn't overwrite them. It doesn't um, alter your actual original images. All of your edits until you export are here in the Luminar catalog. So it looks like there's a question here from Vivian. I don't do a lot of advanced things so far in Luminar AI. What I'd really like to see is the ability to hover over the templates to view them without clicking on each one. So I get it. I really wish it could do that as well. The big reason that it doesn't at this time is it's very, very memory intensive. So especially for people who have lower end computers, it, it bogs them down really bad when we had that enabled. We disabled it because it really sped up the software, but I understand it's a big convenience to be able to see those previews. So I hope we do get that back at some point in the future, but right now the reason for that is performance. So hopefully that answers your question there, Vivian. All right, so let's go ahead and jump back over to our presentation here. The next thing I want to talk a little bit about are templates. So templates are kind of the cornerstone in editing in Luminar AI. It's very similar to a preset, but it is a lot more than that because it, it does package up a lot of the AI technology. And it can also include things like textures and masks and things like that. So it's much smarter than a typical preset, which is just a recipe for you know, this slider goes to this point and this slider goes to this point. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to start with this image, really, really beautiful landscape, but it needs a little bit of extra pop. And templates are a great way to do a quick edit. And you don't have to do any more than that. It's completely up to you. All of these things can be further edited, but if you're in a hurry, you can just go to templates. I'm going to go ahead and click back here. And you can take a look at the for this photo section. This is going to give you some options that the AI think might be a good fit, or you can scroll down to your favorites, ones you've created or purchased, 
and a bunch of other template collections that are present in Luminar AI. For me, I love the scenery category. There are two here that I really love, um, Fast Fix and Clear and Sharp, but you can always click on these to preview them and audition them and see what works well for your image. For this photo, I like Fast Fix. It doesn't go over the top. It just adds a little bit of pop. So we can take a look here at the before and the after, and that image is ready to go. You can send that off to your friends and family, share it on social media, and you're good to go. So the next thing I wanna talk about a little bit is some of the tools that we have available in Luminar AI to further refine those edits you can make with a template. In, if you're shooting for landscapes and travel, some of my favorites are gonna be Sky AI, which will allow you to replace the sky. Structure AI is wonderful for bringing out mid-tone clarity. And you can also move it to a negative value to soften images and then mask that in in certain areas. Very, very powerful. If you're a portrait photographer, a couple of my favorites here are gonna be Face AI, Boca AI. These are amazing tools that allow you to really make your portraits stand out from the crowd and you don't have to do a lot of manual masking, if any at all. The AI recognizes humans, it recognizes their teeth, their smile, their eyes, and even separates them automatically from the background to create a shallow depth of, depth of field effect, like we see here in the bottom right corner. So let's go ahead and play with those a little bit. And we go over here to Luminar AI, hit the G key on my keyboard to go back to my grid. And let's work on this beautiful image from Dan and Shell. This is actually one of their self portraits. And Dan and Shell are photographers that we work with. They're super cool people. And you can see they've got a great relationship. They take some really, really fun pictures. So we'll start on this image with a template. And I'm going to go back to my main templates menu and take a look here at the for this photo section. I'm going to say, let's say influencer might have some good options. And again, we can scroll through these to see what might be a good fit. I really like Evening Glow. It adds a nice little bit of opening of the shadows. It gives it almost a little bit of a matte feel effect. And I think it's a much better starting point for our image. But let's take this a little further and refine it. I'm gonna go over to Edit and into our Tools. There we go. And when we look through this list, we notice that some of these tools already have a little dot next to them. That means that that template that we applied is putting some of these things into play. So we can take a look and see how they're used and modify those if necessary and add other tools. So the first one I want to take a look at here is our mood tool. And this adds that particular color toning that we see. We can turn it off and back on. And then we can even adjust that amount, contrast, saturation amount, but boost the, boost the saturation a little bit, pull up a little bit more on the contrast, and even a little bit more on the amount. And I think that looks really, really nice. Now, as I scroll down, I see that film grain is being used. Some people like to add a little bit of film grain to their images. I'm not one of them. It's not to my particular taste. So I'm going to go into that tool click that reset button and just turn that off so I have a little bit cleaner image to work with. Now, as I look at this, it is a little bit crooked and I think the composition and crop could be a little bit better. So we can scroll back up to the top, use our composition AI to refine this. I'm gonna go ahead and hit the level button and our upright tool here, just to straighten out some of those horizontals and verticals. That's much, much better. And now I'll click on composition AI and this gives me a suggested crop. Now it's up to you whether you wanna use this or not. For me, I'm thinking it's, it's pretty close. It got me closer to where I wanna be, but I'm actually gonna pull this in a little bit tighter. It creates a little bit more intimacy with our couple. And it also removes that distracting handle here from the bottom left corner. Once I'm done, I'm gonna hit the return key on my keyboard, or you can click into any other tool and you're good to go. All right, let's see what else can we can refine here. She does have a little bit of shine on her face. That's a great time to put our portrait tools to use. I'm gonna go down to Skin AI, and I'm gonna move that amount slider up a bit to smooth out their skin. Now, because we have both a male and a female in this image, you wanna be careful as to how much skin smoothing you're using. When, you know, we tend to wanna add a little bit more skin smoothing to a female than to a male. So you wanna make sure you're keeping an eye on that 
and keeping it where you want that the best represents the people that you're photographing. I'm also gonna move up the shine removal just to kind of tone down those hot spots on our skin. And you see that makes a huge difference. We can turn that tool off and then back on and it really tones down those brightest points. Now we can zoom back out. The final thing I wanna do here is to add a nice big soft vignette. So I'm gonna take my amount slider and move that down to negative 100. The reason I pull it down so low is so I can see what's really being affected. I might even pull it on the size a little bit more and then click into my advanced settings and bring the feather up really high for a smooth transition and maybe even add a touch of inner light, which is gonna add a little bit of extra glow to the center. And then take that amount slider and back it off to a point that it looks natural and is just drawing us in to our subjects. I think that looks wonderful. Now what happens if we want to use the same settings across a series of images? I'm gonna click back to my catalog and right click on my image and go to that same folder of images. And you can see I have a handful of images all from the same photo shoot. So there's a few options that I can use to get these settings across this entire series of images. I can right click on that photo, go to my adjustments and copy adjustments and paste those to a single image. So I can go to my adjustments and paste. And that's going to take those settings from this image and apply them here. I can also select the image that I edited in and then hold down my shift key to select a range and then go to that first image, right click adjustments and synchronize adjustments. And that's gonna sync those changes across every image in that series. So it's a really quick and easy way to create a cohesive look and feel for a series of images. You can see those are updating as we go along. And now we have a series that all go together and they're ready to either deliver to your client or you can further go into each and every one of these and make those subtle refinements that might need to be happen, but it gets you that much closer to your finished image. All right, how are we doing in the chat there, Carl? I see that there's nothing popping up in the Q&A. Let me take a look here at the chat pod. And no new questions in the chat either at this point in time. Awesome. Um, I was gonna type in a little pro tip. Um, one of the things you'll note is that Angela backed the uh, visibility of the vignette down quite a bit. If you back it down to where it's just barely, barely perceivable, it still draws the eye in without having that darkened corner. So experiment with just lightly applying it. Yes, definitely. So let me go back over here to vignette and let's take a look really quick. I can turn that off and then back on, you don't need a lot of vignette to draw the eye in. And in fact, if people realize that you've added a vignette, you've probably gone too far. So that's, that's kind of my, my thing. And one thing that I've noticed for myself is if I zoom way out, or if you're looking at your picture on say social media, the smaller the image is, the more pronounced the vignette. And so if you make the image a bit smaller and you can see that vignette, you either need to feather it more right here, or decrease the amount because the last thing you want to know, want people to notice is the vignette, at least in my opinion. So Ed asked, how can you tell when the application is processing? That is a great question. So when you see the, lo the logo up here in the upper left pulsing and it has like a little color going through it, that means that the application is processing and loading the image and rendering those changes that you just made. So some certain um, tools take a little bit longer to render than others. Um, it just means there's more number crunching going on under the hood. So just be patient. If you see this pulsing up here in the upper left, that means things are, are uh, thinking. Um, Malcolm has a question. So could I tone down the light behind her? Well, absolutely. So there's a few different ways we could do that. We could do first one here would be a global change. We'll go to our light tool and pull down on those highlights. And this is gonna affect every highlight in the image. Let me go ahead and move this back to fit to screen so we can see it a little bit better. And so that's gonna be a global change. If you just wanna affect that area right there, there's a couple of different ways to do that. The first one would be to go down to your dodge and burn, choose darken, make sure you have a big soft brush and bring that strength down a lot because you wanna do small strokes that are going to give you a very muted effect. 
Now, there is not a lot of detail there to work with, so there's not a lot we can do. And you see, as I get too carried away, we start darkening down some of the tile over here. That's not my preferred look, but there's very little we can do rather besides lighten and darken in the dodge and burn. If you wanna have a little bit more control, the best option is to go to local masking and add basic. And here I can control not just my exposure, the light and the dark, but I can actually just pull down on the highlights and you see those highlights coming down in that whole area. And now I can brush that effect in just on that area to tone that down a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me. So you see, it still needs a little bit of refinement and I'm gonna actually reset that and bring those highlights down a little bit more and then bring the opacity of my brush down to a lower level. And that way I can get in here and do a little bit more softer, refined um, edit there without it being quite so obvious that I darkened it down. Now, the hard part is, is there's not a whole lot of detail to work with. When you have an area like that, sometimes you have to work with the contrast because um, you don't want to turn it gray. The tendency when you're darkening down blown out highlights is those areas can turn gray and muddy. And that's not an attractive look for me. I'd rather them stay white than turn a muddy gray. Um, another tool you could use to work with that would be super contrast. And that would be, you could pull up your highlights contrast and you see that's adding back a little bit of detail there, but you can see where those brightest areas are. There's not a lot of detail to be had. So you can pull that back in a little bit more and that does help, but it's still, there's still a lot of blown out pixels there that it's just really hard to bring that back. All right. Looks like we have a question here from Ken. Did your most recent update cause Luminar AI to process images more efficiently? I've noticed that I'm not using as much resources on my computer as I did before. I like that question. And I love that you're having an easier time and not using as much resources. With every single update that our developers do, they are working to improve the performance and efficiency of the software. So there are absolutely things going on under the hood to make things run faster. Um, as I'm not an engineer or a developer, I can't speak to exactly what they did, but I know that's a really high priority that they work on with every single update. And as Angela knows, of course, I went straight into and started poking on it using the, uh, the system monitoring tools. And so what I saw was uh, several of the tools did become more efficient. They were both faster and they used less RAM. Some of the other ones seem to either stay the same or may even uh, be taking a little bit more RAM. So as they train the program and, and it gets more intelligent about doing things, that'll flex a bit. But in general, there were definite improvements. Awesome. Yeah, I can always rely on Carl to give me the, the more technical <laughs> the more technical breakdown. I appreciate that a lot. All right, let's do one more quick edit here because I know not everybody does portraits, we wanna look a little bit at landscapes too. And so this is a really beautiful scene. We've got some great reflections in the water, kayaker out on this beautiful placid lake. I actually wish I was there right now. Um, what I'm gonna do is do a quick edit here with a template. So I'm gonna go back to my main templates page. And again, scroll down to the scenery category. If you follow my coffee breaks on a regular basis, you'll note that I come to this particular category often. Not only do I photograph landscapes myself quite a bit, but I find that this one called Fast Fix makes a greater, better starting point for almost any image, not just landscapes. So I encourage you as you're going through and learning different templates, learning what they do, don't feel like you have to use only portrait uh, templates with portraits and landscape templates with, te with landscapes. Mix and match those. The AI is smart enough to know that if there's not a person in the scene, the portrait tools included, they'll just disregard. So it's not gonna make any strange artifacts because you use a portrait template on your landscape. There's other tools that go into making each one of those. So if you find one that works well for a variety of different images that really fits your style, make sure you mark it as a favorite. And then later on, you can find it more easily here under this favorites panel. So you can see there's a handful that I've marked that I use quite a bit. And there's my fast fix. So we've added fast fix and it's popped the color a little bit. It's given us a little bit more contrast and it's just overall a better starting point. I do see a couple of questions here. Um, 
Joe asked, did my fast fix template dehaze the image too? Well, it certainly gave that effect, but let's check. So I can go to edit and the dehaze tool is under our landscape tool. And while it didn't add any dehaze, it did add a little bit of golden hour. So what probably happened here, we can take a look maybe under our light tool. Nope, smart contrast is the same. Enhanced AI does affect contrast. So we can turn that off and back on. So we can see that actually added a ton of contrast right there. And I'm going through and I'm taking a look at which tools were used. Uh, Color Harmony might add a little bit of contrast. That's mostly gonna be popping colors though. And you can see that's a very subtle change. So I think the biggest contrast change that we had here was from our Enhanced AI. So that is a great question. And let's see, John asked a couple of times, I've been unable to send a photo I've worked on, worked hard on in AI. Apple Photos claims it doesn't recognize the software. That's concerning. Um, I found the best way to work around was to copy the photo and send the photo or work for some reason. John, that's something our support team will need to take a look at and find out exactly what steps you took in the program so we can replicate and troubleshoot that issue. Um, I'm glad you found a workaround that's able to get that hard work that you put in back out of the software but definitely reach out to support at skylum.com. You can also go here to the help menu and go to provide feedback. And that's gonna take you to our support page on the website. So hopefully that will get that resolved for you. All right, so let's go ahead and do a little bit more with this image. We added a template which popped our colors a little bit, but we have a pretty bland sky. You can see there's a little bit of clouds over here and up here on the right. But what, wouldn't it be nice to have a little bit more going on here? I'm going to go to Sky AI, which is our sky replacement tool. And I'm going to click on sky selection. And I know I want to go to these cotton skies by Sergei Dolia. These are a pack of skies that are available in the Skylo marketplace. And also, if you're a Luminar X member, I believe they're available through that membership as well. And they're really, really beautiful blue skies. Now, when replacing a sky, I find for myself, I typically like to match like with like, meaning if it's a sunset that's a little bit bland, I wanna probably put another sunset in there. If it's a blue sky, I just wanna, I wanna keep that blue sky feel, but maybe just add a little bit more visual interest to the sky. I mean, it's completely up to you. You can, you can mix and match those things as you like, but I found I get the best results when I really pay attention to what's going on in the scene already and pay attention to that direction of light and, really try to match the mood. So what I'm gonna do here is let's pick, um, let's go with this one here and give it a second to render. That looks really, really pretty. Now, a couple of things that I'm noticing here, the light is hitting this face of the mountain and it's coming in from the left very subtly. If we look at our clouds, the light is hitting those clouds from the right. So what we'll wanna do is go to our sky orientation and click flip. And that's gonna flip it around so the direction of the light more closely matches what's happening in the image. So you wanna pay attention to that. Take a look at your photo, see where the primary light source is coming from, and then find a sky that matches that direction or that you can flip to match that direction. From there, you can click the horizon position. This is gonna bring up a gradient to where you can blend your sky with what was there before. So we can move this up or down to get a more realistic look. Might pull that in a little closer there. I like that blend, that goes nicely. And then you can adjust it vertically, horizontally. You can relight the scene. This is especially important if you're popping in, let's say a colorful sunrise or sunset into a blue sky scene, or maybe an overcast day. The tones of light in the sky, in reality, affect what's going on in the foreground. So you wanna make sure that quality of light transfers over. In a situation where you're putting a blue sky in on a blue sky, it's not nearly as important. And in fact, I'm gonna pull off the relight because I don't wanna make the scene in the foreground more blue than it already is. The last thing, or second to last thing I wanna do here is we wanna look at reflections. And you'll probably notice we've got some really beautiful, realistic reflections happening down here in the water. And it's really awesome that the AI does this now. In original versions of Sky AI, Reflections were not part of it. This is something we added in this last year, and it's really, really cool. So you can increase or decrease the amount. So if you want it a little bit more pronounced, you can pull that up, and you can even increase the amount of blur there in the water. 
So there we go, that looks pretty good. And the last thing I wanna do is go down to my sky adjustments. And this is another great way to make sure that what's happening in your sky is blending well with your foreground. I usually like to pull up the atmosphere case pretty high. And that just seems to blend and look more natural to me. It's a personal taste thing. And then if you're taking a photo that has a very shallow depth of field, make sure you pay attention to this defocus and defocus that sky so it matches what's going on in your scene. In this particular instance, we've got great, very wide depth of field. We have good focus from front to back. So I'm gonna leave those clouds sharp. But that's just something you wanna pay attention to as you're doing a sky replacement. All right. So keep those questions coming if you have them. I'm gonna take a quick look here at our chat. Oh, John says, wouldn't it be cool to have the sky tool suggest the best sky additions? That is a really cool idea. I'm gonna pass that on to our team. I hadn't even thought about that, but with all of the other AI things that examine your image, we recommend templates, things like that, that seems like a, a natural progression. So we'll see maybe if we can get that to happen in the future. But John um, and everyone else, if you have suggestions or things you'd like to see, do send email to support at skylum.com. Mention that it's an enhancement request and just let them know what you think. And as those things are received by support, they kind of tick upwards on their list of things to get done. Um, yep. I will tell you that technically it's another hard one because the machine learning on that one would be pretty, pretty amazingly <laughs> difficult. Um, there was also a comment, Angela, from Joe Aldrich about using uh, going positive instead of negative on uh, uh, Vignettes. Uh, would it be so, kind of like an or an effect? So I just thought you might want to, you know, think about that and give us an opinion. So going pot, let me go ahead and switch back over here to Luminar and um, let's go back over to that portrait because that's more where I'd use something like this. So with a vignette, I very rarely take the vignette lighter. The only time I do that is if I'm trying to correct a lens defect. So there are certain lenses out there that give you a bit of the darkened edge and that's a defect of the lens. And typically I would go to fix that down under the optics tool. And that's where I would go into my advanced settings and here's a D vignette setting and that's gonna lighten those corners. Now, once in a while, you might wanna lighten the edges slightly just to draw, again, draw you into your subject in a certain way. Um, it's not something I do very often. And a lot of times when I see it done, it's done, I'm trying to think of the nicest way to put this. It just looks very dated. Um, it's, it's not to my taste, but everybody's taste is different. So my taste shouldn't dictate yours. If you like doing a lighter vignette, go for it. Um, as opposed to doing like an Orton effect, that's gonna be under our glow tool. And we have an Orton effect and we have Orton effect soft. I actually really like the soft one. And you can pull that up. I usually as I'm going through and auditioning these looks, I'll pull it up pretty high, click through the different types of glow that we have to see which one best suits the image. So glow looks pretty good there. Soft focus is too bright. And I think actually the, the regular Orton effect to me is a little too much as well, but I really like Orton effect soft. And then I would back off that amount to a point that it suited the image well. So hopefully that gives you a, a better idea of what to use those two tools for. And again, if you wanted to take your vignette the other direction, you can certainly do that right now. I'm at a negative 60, but you can move it the other way to lighten up those edges. But as I said, typically I do that to fix a problem, um, not so much as a creative effect, but you know, you do you. I encourage you to do you. All right, let's pop back over to the presentation here and briefly talk about using Luminar AI as a plugin. So our software um, aims to be very inclusive depending on, regardless of how you like to work. If you're looking for a single solution, Luminar AI is great because it can run as a standalone. But if you've been photographing for a while, you use Photos for Mac, you're using Lightroom, we can work with your software to make it fit into your workflow. For me personally, I'm a Lightroom Classic user. My entire library from the last 15 plus years is in Lightroom and I use Luminar AI as a plugin and it works brilliantly. If I'm wanting to do a quick edit, I'll send it directly from Lightroom to Luminar and then it round trips comes right back. Or if I have something more in depth that I wanna do, I'll send it to Photoshop and that's where I can work with layers 
and do much more sophisticated in-depth edits. It completely depends on your workflow, what you wanna do and what you have available, but there are a lot of options to make Luminar AI fit into what you're doing already. All right, final step of the process. Our pictures are no good if they're just stuck on our computer in a catalog that only one program reads, right? So we wanna make sure you can get those pictures out to share. Um, there's a handful of different ways to export images out of Luminar AI. The easiest one, the one I use the most is gonna to be to right click on your image and simply go to export. And this will let you choose where you wanna save this on your hard drive. You can rename the file and set a variety of parameters for the file type that you want. If you're gonna be sharing this on the web, usually a 1920 by 1080 or a 1920 on the long edge is a good way to go. I typically add a small amount of export sharpening um, for web, sRGB is great, JPEG. And then depending on where you're sending this, that's where you might wanna alter the quality. If you're emailing it to a friend, no harm at leaving it 100. If you're putting it on social media, I'd probably back this off to about 75. Just to pull back on that quality a little bit, make it a little bit harder for somebody to steal if they wanted to print it. And that's another reason we make this size here a bit smaller than the original is so if somebody decides to download and print your image without your permission, they're not gonna be able to blow it up nearly as large as they would have if they, if they had the full resolution. Now, if you're like me, you love to print and that printing is like the ultimate, you know, so sharing on social media is fine, but creating a physical print is something that you wanna do. You're gonna to wanna to do a full resolution JPEG or a TIFF. Now, what you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to is where you're sending that print to get created. If you're sending it to a print lab, check with that print lab on what their specifications are, what they recommend. Some will ask for a JPEG, some will ask for a TIFF, and they may even specify which color space you should use. If you're printing at home, check with the, the specifications for your particular printer, and that'll give you a better idea of what you need to do there. Let's see here. Um, Ed asked, can you show how to send back to photos in Mac OS? I'm getting a lot of lost edits. Ed, that's actually a great topic for a separate coffee break for us to talk about photos for Mac OS. Let me go ahead and put that onto my list and we'll do a separate episode on that. But the way that I would recommend doing that to begin with is if you're starting in photos for Mac OS, click the edit button. Then once you're in the edit mode in photos, go up to the button that has the three dots. That's your extensions menu, choose Luminar AI. That will launch Luminar AI inside of uh, photos for Mac do your edits and then you click apply and it takes it right back into photos. I've never had an issue with that workflow, but um, if that's not working right for you, make sure you reach out to support at skylum.com and we'll take a look at that and see what we can do to get that resolved for you. All right. And Joe says, do you have a suggestion how to best manage multiple exports in different sizes for different social media site requirements? <clears throat> that is a great question. So with Luminar, if you're using Luminar as your home base, unfortunately we don't have a way to set various presets. So what I would do is keep either a document on your computer, a sticky note attached to your monitor of what those recommended specs are for the different things that you frequently export. So you can easily pop those in there. Um, what you could do is send us a, a feature request to our support team for export presets. And I think that would be a really great addition. I've requested it, but the more of you who request that, the better the chance of us getting that implemented in the future. All right, so, and just as I really meant naming and segregating the different versions. Oh, okay, so <clears throat> what I would do there is, let's say for this image, I wanted to do an archival copy with all of my edits. So for that, I would probably do my original size, um, low sharpening for this particular image would be fine. I'd probably do a Profoto RGB, a TIFF, 16 bits, no compression, and I would do this at 300 pixels per inch. And then I would say underscore archive. Um, so that would be one thing to do. If you are wanting to do this for Facebook and you wanted to do, let's see, let's say Facebook, FB for Facebook, Let's go ahead and do our long edge, 1920. Um, there might even be a different size that they recommend these days. So 
certainly check with your social media platforms that you're using to see what size they recommend. Um, if you upload a larger size than their recommendation, they will downsize it for you, which really can compromise quality. So um, I know there's a lot of different platforms out there these days. So check with your social media platform that you use the most to find out which size they recommend. But I would just append um, an underscore FB. If I did one for Instagram, I'd probably do IG. Um, if I was doing it for email, add email there. And that's how I would name those different versions. Now, for me, what I do typically is if I do an email version or a Facebook version, once I upload or send that off, I delete those copies because there's no reason to keep them. All of my edits are still in Luminar. And if you've made an archive copy, you still have that archive copy as well, which you can go in and export as a smaller one at any time. So there's no reason to keep multiple versions of the same multiple sizes of the same image on your computer. You certainly can, but for me, it just takes up more hard drive space than is necessary. All right. Yep, suffix, uh, Joe, suffix on the image name with your output format. Uh, you might also wanna, if you're using different plugins, different software, you might also wanna put in, let's see, let's do underscore LAI for Luminar AI and then underscore email, up to you. Another thing that I like to do, especially if I'm sending it off to friends and family is you can do, let's say if this was my image, I would do um, parentheses C for copyright my name in there and then underscore and then the rest of it. So that way it also indicates to whoever has that original file, that's my copyright. Just, you know, it's just a visual reminder. It doesn't necessarily deter somebody who's intent on doing something wrong, but it does let people know that that image is yours. So some great, great things there. Good questions. Now Malcolm says, when you crop, crop down button, should you choice? When you on the crop tool down the button, it shows you a choice. Okay, I think I see what's saying, what he's saying there. Let me go back over here to Luminar. And if we go up here to our composition AI under our ratio, there are a couple of presets in here. So for Facebook feed and Facebook cover. Um, the Facebook cover one's gonna give you that long narrow one. I wanna say it's close to a 16 by nine, but not quite. Um, so that's when you can do for the Facebook feed, I believe it's going to be something close to a 16 by nine. All small well, no, notes. The, the cover is definitely more long and narrow. Um, I prefer to go in and find those pixel dimensions myself. And I would just type them in here under enter custom because these things change over time. And I'm honestly not sure how often they get updated in here. So at, every time that Facebook changes their layout, these things would need to change too. So that's where I just make my own and enter them in the custom field. All right, let's go ahead and pop back over here to Keynote. We talked about exporting. All right, so we're getting towards the end here. Lots of great questions today. If you have additional questions, the best place to go is to the Skylum website. I mentioned earlier, skylum.com slash support. You can also get there directly from Luminar AI by going to the help menu and provide feedback. You also wanna make sure you check out manual.skylum.com. That is our comprehensive user guide. And you can also access that from the help menu right here, user guide. There is a description of literally every slider in this program, every tool, you can find out exactly what they do. And a lot of the sections even have short videos explaining how to use them. So it's a very, very powerful guide to get you where you need to be. If you have questions that you wanna ask somebody else, insiders.skylum.com is our online community. Uh, I hang out there, my colleague Vanelli hangs out there as do a lot of our executives, developers, support team. We do our best to answer your questions there as well. We would also love if you would join us on our daily coffee breaks. I know a lot of you here are my regulars, so I appreciate every single one of you who shows up on a regular basis and spends some time with me. Um, but we do on Insiders, it's about 30 minutes to an hour, Monday through Thursday, it's a Zoom meeting where you can come in, ask questions. We do a short demo on a specific topic, but then we open the floor for whatever photography topic you guys wanna talk about. It's very informal and very fun. We do a similar show on YouTube every afternoon. And that's the link here, luminar.tips.coffeebreak. That's gonna take you to our YouTube channel. And you can watch previous episodes. We do those in a much shorter format. It's usually the same topic, 
but they're much, much shorter. And then of course you can find Skylum on your favorite social media channels. If you guys wanna get in touch with me, email me at Angela at I also have up on the screen, my personal website for my photography and where you can find me on social media. I would love if you would follow along and you know, drop me an, a note and let me know where I can find you because I love seeing all the cool things that you guys are creating from everywhere around the world. And there's Vanelli's, let's see here, any q and I think we've covered most everything, but let me take a look here through our chat and see if there's anything that I've missed. Let's see here. You pretty much got it, Angela. Awesome. <laughs> Charles says the light vignettes trigger him. That's hilarious. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's an artistic choice. It, it, exactly. some things, I'm, I'm sure there are pictures it's brilliant for. Say I was oh. going to do an old Western style photo. <laughs> you could, yeah. All right. Well, I think that's it for today. Thank you guys so much for joining me, Carl. Thank you as always for for filling in as help, uh, helping me moderate and keep on top of all the questions. I um, wanna wish you guys a wonderful weekend and then we'll be back with you on Monday. See you guys Cheers later. All. Cheers. <laughs>